proclaim his excellencies. We know that, we believe that. That's our task, that's our wonderful privilege in life, to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us. And yet, we have sought to address the numerous ways in which we are hindered uh, by fear, whatever it may be. And so our summer series has been addressing various factors that have been hindrances to accomplishing what our Lord wants us to do. And even after all has been said, still come back to uh, maybe an excuse, a crutch, well, I don't like to argue. And so we have tonight, very pleased that Jeff Jenkins is with us and his wife, Laura. I've been looking forward to meeting Jeff and looking forward to hearing him uh, addressing this subject um, that we may use, uh, I don't like to argue. Jeff. Thank you very much, Brother Ed. It is a, a real pleasure to be with you. We have uh, known of this church and appreciated you uh, through the years for your great work for the kingdom of God, for your influence for good in this community and throughout uh, our region. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet Brother Ed. I don't think we've ever met, but I'm delighted to meet him. And we've certainly known and heard of his good work through the years. It's been a pleasure to know uh, John through some of our activities that we've been a part of in various places. And so we have a great appreciation for this church and for uh, your preachers and for the work that you're doing. And it is a genuine honor to be here tonight and to study with you from this great sermon that's recorded in Acts chapter 17. And if you'd like to, to be turning there, we're going to spend most of our time tonight in this great uh, chapter of the Bible, in this great sermon that we have recorded there. It really starts, if you want to go back, to the end of Acts chapter 14. The Apostle Paul, of course, is in Antioch, and the Bible says at the end of chapter 14 that he stayed with the brethren there a long time. And then when you come to chapter 15, if you're looking at the text, you know that there were some uh, people, some men who came from Judea, and they started teaching that you had to be uh, circumcised according to the law of Moses, and if you were not, circumcised according to the law of Moses, you could not be saved. And um, Paul in Barnabas, verse 2 says, uh, had great dissension and debate with them. Now, I don't know what translation of the Bible you're using tonight, but different translations translate uh, this idea in different ways. The old King James Bible said they had no small uh, dissension or no small debate, or no small discussion. The Greek is a very uh, interesting idea here. The Greek phrase is uh, uh, oligos stasis. Uh, the word oligos means small or little. The word stasis is a very interesting word. It is sometimes translated uh, dissension or discussion, uh, but it also means um, it's the word that the Greeks use for the idea of insurrection. And so what occurs here in uh, Antioch is a little bit more than the, the idea that we get in our English translations. It appears there was going to be an insurrection here, and the people were going to rise up and, and, and fight, and, and Paul and Barnabas were involved in this discussion, and so some of them wanted to send them to uh, Jerusalem, to the church in Jerusalem. They met with the apostles and the elders, and as you know, they had this uh, great discussion about uh, who could be saved and who couldn't be saved in Acts chapter 15. I read Acts chapter 15, and I think about our topic tonight. I don't like to argue. I think, man, I just, this is one of those times, uh, Brother Ed, I'd rather be at a church fellowship. You know, I, the, you, you've ever been in those kind of meetings, uh, Brother Fallis, you know, with elders and preachers and, and different groups of people, and you think, I wish I was at a potluck tonight. Uh, I don't really care for casseroles, but I'd lot rather have casseroles in some of the, the meetings I've been in. And this was one of those kind of meetings. It, it, didn't, it, it wasn't very pleasant. Well, they seemed to uh, be able to, to at least work things out to some degree or to some level of satisfaction. And, and Paul uh, and Barnabas, they go on their way. And, and now, remember, Paul is about to embark, when you come to the end of chapter 15, on his second missionary journey. He, uh, in chapter 16, he gets the Macedonian call. At the end of chapter 16, he goes to Philippi, and there he baptizes Lydia and the women who are there with 
uh, Lydia, and then you come to uh, Paul being arrested and thrown in jail, and at midnight they're singing praises to God, and uh, there's a great earthquake, and the jailer comes in, he's about to take his life, and Paul says, don't do yourself any harm, we're all here, everything's going to be okay. And the jailer and his entire family are baptized, all of his household, and Paul uh, now is um, on his way to Thessalonica. He goes to Thessalonica, he goes to Berea, and now when you come to our text in Acts chapter 17, Paul is headed to Athens. And he's going to Athens, and um, I don't see the slide. Are the slides on? We got the slides? Do y'all see them and I don't? Uh, all right. Well, we might not have the slides. I had great pictures tonight. Not many words on there, but had great pictures. Um, there we go. There we go. Uh, Paul had come to uh, Athens, and he's come to Athens there to wait uh, there on to wait for the arrival of of Timothy and Silas. And it's this occasion for Paul's famous sermon on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. This picture right here, you, you might recognize. Uh, one or two of those guys, the, the fellow on, on the right, the far right, that's Steve Bailey. Y'all know Steve Bailey, don't you? I think he's been over here a number of times, preaches over in Mesquite. And uh, the guy in the middle, that's the guy speaking tonight. The guy on the left over there, that's uh, Dino Russos. Some of you may know Brother Dino. He's a longtime um, Greek gentleman who uh, was raised in uh, the beautiful island of Santorini. If you've ever seen those postcards, some of the most beautiful pictures in the world. There's a picture of Greece, and it's got Santorini. It's got those blue and white domes on the top. He grew up in one of those uh, houses over there. Uh, and now he preaches for the church in Athens. And we were there last year. And we went to Mars Hill. And Brother uh, Dino read, if you, you can see that plaque, I don't know, can't make it out. But that's Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 17. And that's written in the Greek language. And he read it uh, in the Greek language. Now, I've taken a lot of Greek in my life uh, in classes uh, from my days at Fried Hardeman through graduate school, and I've even taught some courses in Greek, and I love the study of Greek, and I learned something interesting. I went over there to Greece, and you know, those people over there, they can't speak Greek correctly. I mean, it's amazing to me the number of words that they mispronounced over there, because I learned in Tennessee how to speak Greek correctly. Well... Uh, anyway, I, I learned a lot while I was in Greece, and I was taking notes how they were pronouncing words, and I made this guy go through the Greek alphabet with me, and it didn't sound like the way I learned it, so I, I learned a lot over there. But but this is, uh, but he read this sermon from Paul in Acts 17 while we're on uh, Mars Hill. Uh, here's here's what I want to tell you about the city of Athens, because all of this is pertinent to our, pertinent to our discussion tonight. Um, two, two things about the city of Athens. Um, the first thing that we need to know about these Athenians is that it is a city that personified a culture that was given over to hedonism or the pursuit of physical and, and sensual pleasures. If you look at Acts 17, notice with me in verse 18, you'll read that among this group were some people called Epicureans. Um, the Epicureans believed in a philosophy that was akin to our modern-day existentialism. Uh, Epicureans had this idea that, that they did not deny the existence of gods, a little g, uh, like the deists do. They held that all gods are distant and uninvolved in the affairs of humankind. We believe there are these things called gods, and when they talked about these things called gods, they literally meant things. They meant idols and images and, and um, uh, man-made images uh, made of clay and stone and brick and, and iron and metal. And they believed that they were these things and they believed they had no association with humankind. And the Epicureans said, yeah, we believe there are gods, but we don't believe that these gods interact with mankind in any way. These gods can't do anything for man. They believe that the only reason that man existed was in some way to serve these gods. And they didn't have the concept of worship like we think about worship. Um, and, and these are people 
who, this was their mindset when, when Paul walked through the city of Athens, and, and this picture right here, we're standing literally on Mars Hill. And I believe with all of my heart that the place where we are standing on this, in this scene is very close to where Paul stood. The reason I know that is because Mars Hill is not very large. And if you've been there, it's just really a, I mean, I mean it's tall, but it's not very big round. And there's few rocks and places you can stand there. And, and as you look out, you see the city of Athens. And the city of Athens today is a massive city. Uh, the city of Athens today, there, there are, um, um, I believe the last, what they told us was around 2 million people who live in Athens today. It is a large city, and it is very much like the city of Athens was in the days of Paul, just a, a lot larger. And so it was as Paul stood on Mars Hill, and he looked down into, um, uh, into the agora. The word agora is a Greek word that means marketplace. And while Paul would not see the large buildings like he, we see there, he would see buildings. And he would see people walking on the streets, and, and he could probably hear what was going on below, and they could hear what was going on up, up there where Paul was. And he sees these people, and he's preaching this sermon, and he talks about, I observe that you are religious people, and I observe that you're very mysterious about your religion, and I see that you even have one idol to the unknown God. And some people read that, and they think, aha, so they kind of till, uh, tip their hat a little bit to the God who is the creator of the universe. But it's my belief, based upon the study of Scripture, that when Paul said to the unknown God, that he was not saying, you are worshiping the God that I worship. Here was their attitude. We believe that all gods are okay, and um, we want to make sure that we don't make any gods angry, and so just in case we leave one out, we're going to build this idol to the unknown God. That was the way they approached it. Well, these people were avowed materialists. They believed that this life, in this life, that what you could own during this life and experience during this life, it is all that you would experience in your human existence. They did not believe there was life after this life. They denied the existence of eternity. They lived for the moment. They professed, listen carefully about these Epicureans. They professed a belief that the, the best life was the one that you live free from pain, totally given to the pursuit of pleasure. They might say something like, you're living your best life now. That, that's what they might say. You're living your best life now. Now, if that rings a bell, just hold on to that for a moment. Um, this philosophy... They, they held, they were highly educated. They were the elite people when it comes to education. They, they, um, they, they lined the streets in the temple of Athens with thousands of sculptures of the human body. They worshipped themselves more than anything. So the culture of Athens, and for the most part, the Roman Empire as a whole, was given to the pursuit of sensual pleasure. You go today to the ancient city of Corinth, not too far from Athens, just a, maybe a, a couple of hours drive in a bus, and, and you go to Corinth and you go and you see the, the idols to the Greek god Asclepius. The Greek god Asclepius was the god of medicine. And they believed that if you, if you broke your arm, that you could make a cast of your arm and you bring the cast, and you lay it before the god Asclepius, and he would heal your broken arm. And did you know that both history records, and not only history, but the ge geological findings of, of history say that more casts were made to the human sexual organs than anything else. And it represented the fact that these people um, believed in and lived only for pleasure. Well, that was the, that was the Epicureans. Um, the second thing that I want you to know about the Athenians is that these people were highly involved in learning and culture. And of all the Greek cities, of all the cities of the Roman Empire, Athens was the most famous for being a center of art, of architecture, of philosophy and culture. 
It had lost a lot of its glory um, some four or five hundred years before Paul comes there, but it's still impressive as, as temples like this, the ruins of this temple line the streets. There were philosophers who came from all around the world. Verse 18 tells us also that not only were the Epicureans there, but the Stoic philosophers were there. The Stoics had a higher view of, of the gods, and they held to what today we might call pantheism. That is, they believed that God was to be found in all of nature. That You just look around nature and you find God, and, and we see this type of philosophy in the worship of the earth today, and it's expressed in a lot of the, the New Age kind of teachings. The scriptures tell us in Psalm chapter 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 that you can know that there is a creator just by looking at the, the heavens around you, by looking at the world around you. The Stoics held to a more intellectual philosophy than the, the Epicureans. They felt that there was within each human being what they called a divine spark. And they felt that there was a rational principle that, that held the, the cosmic universe together. And so they believed in reason, and the reason that they submitted to was the idea that every person, because of this divine spark within them, is connected to the gods. It was a time of enlightenment. And what happened was the same thing that happened in our world during the days of Thomas Paine when he wrote the book, The Age of Reason, and they said reason becomes God. One scholar has noted recently, and, and, and this is important because he said the, the prevailing philosophies, listen to these words, the prevailing philosophies of the West post-Christian era, secular humanism, scientific empiricism, and the New Age pantheistic type of postmodernism are remarkably similar to the Epicureanism and Stoicism that Paul encountered at Athens. Remember I said the Epicureans believe that you're living your best life now? Not too long ago, a preacher down in Houston wrote a book called Your Best Life Now. We're living in a country and we're living in a society and we're living in a world that has become secularized to the point of, of saying that, that while we will not deny that there might be a God, we accept all gods as equal. And there's a divine spark in every human being and you have a connection with God wherever you are in the universe and you don't have to worry about worship and, and commitment and service. The secularization of any country is an interesting thing. In the name of education and advancement, educators and intellectuals have, have dismissed the most influential book of all times from our curriculum. It's impossible for us to, to really understand the writings of, of the great men like Milton or Shakespeare or Chaucer without some basic understanding of Scripture. And in our day, when censorship is decried by the liberals of our day, they themselves have censored the Bible. They decry the idea of censorship, but they censored the Bible from the realm of, of, of education, and the results have been devastating. I believe if you were to go back and, and document the decline of our culture over the past four or five decades, one fact that would be glaringly noticeable is the idea, the significant correlation between prayer and scripture being taken out of the public mind and the rapid decline of a culture that we knew, that we once lived in. The scriptures are very clear. The scripture says in Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no revelation, the people of God cast off restraint. You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? That means when we don't believe the Bible, when we don't trust the Bible, when we don't depend on the Bible, when we don't understand that the Bible is inspired of God, that the Bible is inerrant, that the Bible is all authoritative, when we do not believe in the revelation of God, that means there is no end to what mankind will do. And I'm not by nature a pessimistic negative person, but I can tell you without a doubt that is exactly what we're seeing in our country right now. 
exactly what we're seeing in our world right now. now. And so all of this has led to where we are today. A generation of people who embrace as truth, as philosophy, something that says there is no truth. The days of preaching to people who have been who have the most basic understanding of Christianity outside of the church in our nation are just about gone. And I'm not saying this to reminisce about the good old days, but just to establish where we are as we try to communicate Christ to a Christless culture. The number of Americans who don't affiliate with a particular religion has grown to 56 million in recent years making the faith group researchers call what in America what they call the nuns the second largest in total number behind evangelicals according to a Pew Research Center study that has been released just in recent months. An article in the Dallas Morning News dated May the 13th of this year entitled A Country Less Christian says in part that the bulk of the nuns in America say they believe in, and I quote, nothing in particular. They believe in nothing in particular. You see, when you allow the Word of God to be jettisoned, when you allow the Scripture to be taken out of the mindset of a people, when you continue and continue to diminish the Word of God and the authoritative nature of God's Word, when you do away with Scripture, why should you believe anything? Why would you believe anything? You would believe nothing in particular. And so I want to invite you just for a moment tonight to think about Paul in Athens. You know, none of us necessarily enjoy confrontation. We don't necessarily enjoy debate. That statement that I've been assigned tonight, I don't like to argue. I can't explain to you, and, and you don't know me well enough to know whether this is true or not, but I can't tell you how much that describes my attitude about religion and about the church and about life in general. I hate to argue, but there are times in our lives that we must be willing to stand strong for what God's Word teaches, whether we like to argue or not. And So I want to make just a few observations based upon Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 17, and, and, and we don't have time to study it in depth, but, but I want to spend a little bit of time tonight talking about it. The first thing I want you to notice is Paul's motivation, and Paul had a consuming motivation. It consumed his very being. Paul's attitude as he became a child of God and as he lived for God was an all-consuming attitude. You read in Philippians chapter 3 when Paul said that... Um, that I'm now preaching the things that I once persecuted. And Paul talks about the fact that, that, that I want to give my life totally to the one who has controlled me. You see, Paul had this attitude. If you notice verse 16, it says, When Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. The Greek word that is used here for provoke means it's a stronger word than that word provoke. It literally means he was enraged. He, he was angry deep in his soul. He was, one, one scholar says that this word means that Paul was physically and visibly upset at the sight of the idolatry and the paganism. Why is that so? Why was Paul motivated to proclaim to a city that is filled with rationalists and people who worship pleasure? Why was he motivated? Number one, he knew God's truth. Paul knew that these statues were man-made objects that held no power to save. They had no power to protect. There was no power to forgive or to respond. Paul would have agreed with the Epicureans that these types of gods have no interaction with man. Paul knew, as he would state in the sermon, that it was the God of heaven who created both the heavens and the earth and all things, and that he is the giver of and sustainer of life. 
and he gives life and breath to all things, and he doesn't have need of anything. Paul knew that truth, and the deception and the false teachings that surrounded him stirred within his soul a deep and profound righteous indignation. Maybe you've experienced that from time to time in your life. When you know something is false to the core, and you know that it is completely antithetical to what the Scriptures teach. Maybe when the Supreme Court makes a certain decision or the government makes a certain decision and, and you can just feel yourself growing nauseous inside. Paul's knowledge of the truth, the very truth that had set him free, caused him to respond. And ladies and gentlemen, when we know the truth of God's Word, John says, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus' prayer to the Father was sanctify them through your truth, for your word is truth. And when we come to know God's truth, there are times that we cannot be silent. There are times that we cannot sit still. There are times that we must speak, and we must not allow the culture and the prevailing attitude about God and about the church and about religion to overcome what we know to be true. Paul knew that truth, but secondly, he loved that truth. Not only was it his intellect, his knowledge of God's truth that, that stirred him, but Paul loved the truth of God. Friends, one of the things that we must keep in our mind is that the closer we are to God, the more we will love His Word. You cannot truly love God without loving His Word. You cannot truly love Jesus Christ without loving His Word. You can't have Christ without His commandments. You can't have the Lord without His legislation. You can't have the Savior without His statutes. You cannot have Jesus without His judgment. We must love the truth of God's Word. The question that we must ask ourselves is when was the last time that we became upset because of the lostness of the world around us. I vividly recall last June walking up those stairs. I took that picture. Those people in front are very dear to me. I vividly recall thinking about the fact that there's a million plus people in the city below us. And practically none of them are New Testament Christians. I do a lot of traveling and a lot of speaking in places, and a lot of times I fly back into DFW late at night, and I sit on the aisle and I, or I sit on the window seat and I look out the window and I see the lights of the city of Dallas and Fort Worth, and I think about six million plus people that live in this huge metropolis and the vast majority of them do not know the truth of God's word they've not been obedient to the truth of God's word and a few years ago we had this idea that came up that became popular in the church of of, of people that they would talk about the church and the unchurched and the attitude was if somebody goes to church anywhere we ought to just leave them along they're okay we ought to reach out to the unchurched but everybody who, who has not been obedient to the gospel of Christ, every person who has not been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, whether we, whatever we want to call it, they're unchurched because they're not a part of the church that Jesus gave his life for on Calvary. Paul loved this truth. And that brings me to the next thought that he was constrained by God's love. And Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that we talked about earlier, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Then he goes on to say, for the love of Christ constrains us. The old King James Bible said, I believe the love of Christ constraineth us. Some of the other translations say, the love of Christ compels us. Literally what Paul is saying, if you think that I'm mad, you, need to, you think I'm out of my mind, you need to know that the reason I do what I do is because the love of Christ leaves me no other option. That's what that idea of constrain and compels mean. It, it doesn't leave me any other option. 
And so when we truly love Jesus Christ, when we understand as Paul did that he died upon the cross for us, we not only will have this cognitive understanding of the love of God, but we will have an experience of God's love in our life. And we will believe with all of our heart that God loved us so much that he gave Jesus to die for us that we don't have any other option but to tell the truth. That We have no other option but to teach and to preach the truth of God's word. Sometimes people are turned off by the preaching of the Word of God. And sometimes people think that, that in our culture, because of, of, of this idea of the nuns that we read about earlier in the Dallas Morning News, that, that uh, you know we need to be a little bit more careful about teaching publicly things about baptism being for the remission of sins and about uh, having instrumental music in the worship and about uh, allowing women to be leaders and preachers in, in the church. And they try to paint this picture that if somehow we talk about these things, whether it be any of these things or, or homosexual lifestyle or abortion or any of those things, that somehow we are unloving. But the truth is, it is the very love of Christ that leaves us no other option but to do that. We can't quit teaching the truth of God's Word. Oh, we need, to, we need to do so with all of the love in our heart that we can muster. We need to be kind in the presentation of the truth of God's Word, but we must not allow people to have the upper hand when it comes to what the Scriptures teach. And I would add to that, Paul was motivated because he was jealous for God's glory. He knew that there was only one God. And these Athenians were worshiping and giving glory to and ascribing praise to mere stones. The credit that belonged to God was going to idols. Isaiah 42.8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to idols. We cannot give glory or praise to idols, whether they're man-made uh, by the hands of men and their images, or whether they are the images in our mind. Let me move on quickly, because we've got to get to the heart of the matter, and that is Paul's message. If you look at Acts 17, verse 18, you'll read that Paul, at the end of this verse, says that because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection, of course, it is impossible to preach Jesus, that Jesus was resurrected from the dead without first preaching that Jesus was crucified upon a cross. The gospel, plain and simple, was Paul's message. Verse 18 also gives us some insight into how many received his message. Some of them called him an idle babbler. Literally, translation of that says that he was a, a seed speaker. The ideas of, of a bird pecking indiscriminately at scraps of ideas here and there and then passing them off as, as something that is profound. They didn't believe that Paul knew what he was talking about. They thought he was uneducated, that he, was, he did not have any knowledge. They didn't believe that Paul had any understanding. They didn't think that Paul was profound enough and so again, we live in a culture where people are enamored with somebody who seems to be polished when it comes to their ability to speak God's Word. It is of extreme importance that the Scripture tells us that Paul preached Jesus and the resurrection. He was not ashamed of the gospel, as he would say in Romans 1, 16, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Ladies and gentlemen, the culture climate in which we live brings with it a very real temptation to try and to make the gospel more palatable, to make it easier to swallow, to somehow make it seem less harsh. After all, a message that says we have to deny ourselves and tuck up our cross and follow Jesus is going to be an unpopular message in a society that's, that is wrapped in self-satisfaction 
and the pursuit of material things and pleasures, just like the Epicureans and the Stoics in Athens. John MacArthur wrote in his book, Hard to Believe, now comes the issue that's behind all of the, the pop music and self-congratulation and fun that the seeker-sensitive church has promised. People aren't going to buy Christianity if it's that hard. It doesn't meet their needs. They won't be interested. If they want six fruit flavors and you've only got two, you've lost them. They need Christianity that tastes great and is less filling. That in the short run will explain all the hard stuff later. MacArthur goes on to say there's a name for that in the marketing world. It's called bait and switch. I don't agree with everything that John MacArthur has written, but he nailed it on that statement. We live in a world that wants everything to be easier. But the Bible tells us that the gospel will be a stumbling block, that it will be a scandal for those who do not know Christ. But the problem today is that it has become a stumbling block to many who have at times in the past professed Jesus. And the result is we have a watered-down version of the gospel it's trying to be relevant in the culture in which we live, and it ends up compromising the very heart of the gospel message. And it pours over into our worship, and into our families, and into our spiritual walk with God. Well, what was Paul's method? Well, Paul made some general observations. You read in verses 22 and 23. Then you come to verse 17, and, and Paul talks about, has this conversation about religion. Then in verses 18 and verse 28, he, he gives this intellectual argument. Then in verse 23, Paul makes a very pointed confrontation with the people. And in verse 24 and following, he presents the gospel message. He starts out in verse 24 by saying, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in the temple made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things, and he's made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. He's determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations that they would seek God you see, within every human being, there is this God-created vacuum. There's a void. And there are many people who know deep in their heart that there's something missing in their soul. They know that there's something missing in their life. They know that there's something missing in their family, in their home, in, the, in, their, in their spiritual walk. They know that it's not there. And they try to fill it with all kinds of things. And so some people fill it with drugs. Some people fill it with alcohol. Some people fill it with work. Some people fill it with the, possession, the accumulation of things. And there are people who are literally starving to death spiritually. And in too many churches, listen, in too many of our churches, they're being fed a steady diet of substitute. And it will not satisfy the hunger that's in their soul. I'm telling you tonight that the only thing, the only thing that will satisfy the hunger that's in the heart and the soul of mankind, including each one of us who are present tonight, is the life-giving, life-sustaining Word of God. It's the only thing that will satisfy. We're called to share the old, old story to a culture that needs to hear it in the context of where they live and who they are and how they think. That's why it's so important for us to, to have some understanding of, of the prevailing worldviews. We need to be like those men of old who understood the times. We need to have an understanding of the times. But we don't need to allow the times to mold who we are and what we say. So I want to conclude tonight with the mandate from the Apostle Paul to all of us. The mandate of our Lord 
remains the same for us as it has for all Christians over the last two millennia. As we go, we are to make not just decisions, but we're to make disciples. We're to baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're to teach them to do all things that Christ has commanded us. That, that's what our Lord commanded us to do, and we're to do it with all diligence. We need to teach the same thing that Jesus told the apostles to teach. When the people on the day of Pentecost said to Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter could have given a multiplicity of answers. Think about all of the things that Peter could have said. He could have said, you don't need to do anything. God has already done it all for you. He could have said, you just simply ask the Lord to come into your heart. He could have said, if you'll say this prayer, then you can be saved. He said, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you know why Peter answered the question that way? Of course you do. He answered the question that way is because that's exactly how Jesus told him to answer it. You go and you baptize and you teach all nations the things that I've commanded you. And when the people said, Peter, what shall we do? Peter's mind went back to the words of Christ and he said, repent and be baptized. And anybody today, any preacher or religious leader today who answers that question in any way other than the way Peter answered it is not answering it in the way that the Lord commands. We have the mandate to fulfill the mandate to tell the old, old story to a culture that has lost its way. There are two or three things that we must know. Number one, we must be certain of what we believe. The Apostle Paul said, I know him whom I'm persuaded. I know that I'm committed to him. I know that he's going to take care of me. You see, we've got to know what we believe. It's not enough to let the preachers know what they believe or, or to let the elders or the Bible school teachers know what the church believes. Every one of us need to know what we believe. We need to make sure that we understand the truths that are found in God's Word. How are we going to answer the questions of the culture if we don't know the will of God? There was a time when people in the church were known as being people who were book, chapter, and verse people. I'm not certain that's the case today. But may God help us to get back to that time in our lives. May He help that become the calling card of the church of Jesus Christ. That we are people who know what the book says and that we're not afraid to teach what the book says. That we certainly do so in love. We need to be certain of what we believe. Number two, we must be ready to share what we believe with others. Oh, you can have your head full of knowledge. But if you're not willing to share it, it's not going to do you much good. You talk to people that you see at the market. You talk to people that you see in the streets. You share the Word of God with others. People you go to school with or that you work with. Don't be like those people who we've all heard about in our life who have worked side by side for 20 or 30 or 40 years and one day one of them finds out that one's a Christian and the other one said, well, I'm a Christian too. I never knew you were. Are we willing to share what we believe? And not just share it with our lips, but, but share it with our life. You see, our worship to God can't just be from the roof of our mouth. It's got to be from the root of our heart. We must be willing to share what we believe. And then, finally, when it comes to our mandate, we must be faithful to the call that God has given us. We must never give up. People in different parts of the world will respond differently to the gospel of Christ. 
You go to South Africa, where I've had the privilege to go a number of times, and, and people will flock to hear the gospel. They'll flock to hear the preaching of the word of God. They'll respond in, in large numbers. You go to other places in our world, places like Western Europe, where we supported mission work through the years, and it may be years and years before you're able to baptize one person. I recall as a, a young boy going to gospel meetings in my home church, and every year they would have gospel meetings from Sunday to Sunday. Some of you remember two-week meetings. Raise your hand if you remember two-week meetings or, or longer. Look around. That's the old people here tonight, okay? Uh, and I can vividly recall every single service, people being baptized into Christ, people responding to the message of the gospel. We don't see that so often anymore. Part of it may be the culture in which we live, Part of it may also be our lack of faithfulness to the teaching of the gospel. You and I have to be faithful to our Lord in the culture in which He has planted us. We have to be faithful to our Lord in the area in which we live and what He has called us to do. No, I don't like to argue. But I want to make a commitment and I hope you will as well, that as long as we live, that with every breath that we have, we will love the truth of God's Word, we will know the truth of God's Word, and we will speak the truth of God's Word. Regardless of what culture says, regardless of what a nation says, regardless of what a government says, that we will always teach the truth of God's Word. And that we will do so with all of the love that we can find in our heart. If you're not a Christian tonight, I want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you'll give Him your life and repentance, if you'll confess His name before men and be immersed, buried with Him in baptism, He will wash away all of your sins. Just like Peter said on the day of Pentecost, He'll wash your sins away. He'll add you to His church. Your names will be written in the Lamb's book of life and, and you'll be on your road to glory. You can do that tonight. And if you're a Christian tonight and you've not been living for God, if we can pray for you, if we can help you in any way, we invite you to walk down one of these aisles as we stand together as we sing this song.